Uh, once again, I want to welcome us all. And um, we have heard so far about the progress of what uh, the of what the Omics Logic Africa team is actually doing in Nigeria. I uh, in a bit I will be calling on 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 few persons. I hope we are testy enough to to look out for for these persons that um, that uh, will be joining us very very soon. Yeah, my name is Ayonfiolua Alabetutu. I am a molecular biologist and geneticist and I'm um, a PhD candidate. I hail from uh, Nigeria. I, I, I got my, my higher education in Penza, Russia, and I'm a faculty with Russell Academy in, in Russia. I'm a blood pathogen uh, certified expert and, uh, and I am also an enthusiast of, uh, of data analytics, data science, uh, population genetics, bioinformatics, regenerative medicine. I am the African, the Omics Logic Africa Community Engagement Manager. So uh, it's so lovely to be here. On this note, I would love to to uh, prepare to prepare us. Uh, please, I would love that um, Professor Charles Oluwashiwa I would love that he's given a he's given a a a co-host right now as I read his profile. So uh, we will be having a talk session now where uh, Professor will be, will be bringing us uh, some, some insight into bio bioinformatic research in Africa and the impact that it has on the world. Um, Professor Charles Adetunji is a, presently a faculty member at the microbiology department. Um, he's the, the acting dean uh, of the Faculty of Science at Old State University in Nigeria. He, where we utilize the application of biological techniques and microbiological processes for the actualization of sustainable developmental goals and ag agrarian revolution through quality teaching, research, and community development. He's currently the acting director of intellectual properties and technology transfer. He is the AG Dean of uh, Faculty of Science and, and uh, Department of uh, Microbiology in Edo State University. A visiting professor and an, as an, an, an executive director at the Center of Biotechnology Precious Cornerstone University in Ibadan, Nigeria. He has won several scientific awards and grants for renowned academic bodies like Council of Council of Scientific and Industrial Research in, in India, Department of Bio, Biotechnology in India, uh, the World Academy of Science in Italy, in Netherlands. Fellowship program and so on. Uh, is won grants uh, from from the Agency of International Development Co and Cooperation in Israel, uh, Royal Academy of Engineering in the UK, among other places. Has published many scientific journals and article and um, and conference proceedings in referred uh, national and international uh, journals with over three hundred and 70 manuscripts. He is ranked among, amongst the top 500 prolific authors in Nigeria between 2019 to date by Scopius and Saibal. His research interests include microbiology, biotechnology, post harvest management, and nanotechnology. He has recently been appointed as the president and the chairman, the governing council of the Nigerian Bioinformatics and Genomics Network Society. He's presently a serial editor with Taylor's and Charles USA editing several textbooks on, on agricultural biotechnology, nanotechnology, pharma foods, and environmental sciences. So now he's an editorial board member of many international journals and serves as a review of many double-blind peer review Journals like El Siva, Springer, Francis and Taylor, Willie, Plus One, Nature, American Chemistry Society, Bedham Science Publisher is a member of many scientific and professional bodies, including the American Society of Microbiology, about Technological Society of Nigeria, Nigerian Society of Microbiology. It's presently the General Executive Secretary of the Nigerian 
young academic. He has won a lot of international recognition and has also acted as the keynote speaker delivering invited talk position papers for previous university research institutions and several centers of excellence, which we span across several continents of the globe. He has over, over the last 15 years built a strong working collaboration with reputable research groups in numerous and leading society. Uh, at this point, I would love to call on Professor Charles to give us, uh, to take over. So Professor Charles, are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah, Professor Charles, can you hear me? Uh, we can't hear you. Professor Charles, are you there? Good evening, everyone. Yeah, good evening. We can hear you now. Uh, you may need can you to see my screen? Uh, you may need to switch your screen to to the display, I mean, to the- uh, Yes, uh, yes, we can, we can, we can. Yeah, can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes. Uh, we can hear you. Uh, we can see you. Uh, okay. But continue, sir. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yeah, we can see your screen. Hello. Yes, yes, it is visible. Okay, good, good, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so grateful, Dr. Ayofe uh, Labetitu, for bringing me to this great conference. I found it as a great privilege uh, to be talking to you. Uh, today, I'll be talking about some recent bioinformatics innovation at Queen of Sundown for a number of uh, numerous global challenges. And today, as we know, around the world, a lot of people are going through a lot of challenges, a lot of problems. So it is now high time we come together as a scientist in order to solve the global problem. Now, COVID-19 was not ever age in some years to come. And bioinformatics has really played a lot of key role. Now we are in post-COVID era, which shows we need a lot of things. So this has I serve as the president of Nigeria Bioinformatics and Genomics Network and a distinguished professor of biotechnology, bioinformatics, microbiology at Precious Corner School. And also, I'm the executive secretary of Nigeria Young Academy and Sonar Coordinator of West African Microbiology of Nigeria. So, before we go on, this bioinformatics of the thing we are talking about, where does it come up? It's step up from the word of God, uh, which shows everything I care about God. So we form the GTCT of everything, no matter whatever we want to discover, we want to grow about, everything's all about God. So what are we saying in essence? By informatics have become a sustainable tool that will help us to achieve the digital revolution about the sustainable revolution we have been talking about, about the sustainable city, sustainable food, water, health being, uh, well-being of mankind, and energy, decarbonization, and talking about education, gender, and a lot of other stuff. So we show circularity and a lot of things and a lot of place to play. Now, the whole world is going through a lot of low carbon economy and a lot of other things. So my informatics have become a sustainable tool that help us to have a kind of economical, eco-friendly, to manage a lot of things, talking about metabolomics and a lot of other problems. This amount shows that bioinformatics have become a kind of eccentric cycle that encompasses around innovation, sustainable environment, and circular economy. Now, we are trying to digress from linear economy. Now, the whole world is talking about circular economy. Now, which shows that bioinformatics have a lot of play, roles to play around the whole globe, most especially during the era of post COVID. Now, Talking about that industrial four have a lot of things to play with the help of bioinformatics. We're talking about nine pillars of technological advancement. Now we are talking about 11 pillars of technological advancement and developments of bioinformatics have played a lot of crucial. We're talking about industrial stream, industrial city, industrial company, and industrial intelligence have come to play today. That's what we are talking about. 
Now, I would like to share some of my experience as a distinguished professor in the area of bioinformatics, biotechnology, and bioeconomic biology. Now, before I go on, there's a particular model that has really helped me in achieving some of these sustainable development goals. Most of my uh, theory based on how to emphasize divine, IV, potential stereotype, and tests. Before bioinformatics can become adaptable everywhere, we first of all need all to go back to our local community, identify the major challenges. We have to emphasize divine, IV, and test the prototype. Now, now that many of us have not done a lot of things, but we are more key into what is called translation research. So there is difference between research translation and translational research. Now, before we are talking about millennium development goal, but now all of us are talking about uh, sustainable development goal. We form a kind of a pentios for commercial and defense of infrastructure. So bioinformatics as a tool have become a crucial tool for us to have this diverse set of development goal. Now, it has been stipulated that the whole globe is going to increase drastically to 9 billion in the year 2050. As we know, FAO estimated that there is going to be almost 60% transformation and, uh, in terms of agriculture for us to meet the band of the ever increasing population. Now, the issue of climate change is there. So we show uh, definitely bioinformatics have a lot of role to play. Now, there are four major goals of our time. How do we achieve food security, issue of climate change, health, and high rate of environment? Now, my research group have been able to discover a new biobicide to the help of bioinformatics, which we have established the molecular basis, and we have done a lot of sequencing, and they're showing the uh, phylogenetic tree, which shows the uh, relationship between various strains of the biobicide that could be used to uh, form a kind of permanent replacement to chemical synthetic uh, herbicide. And this is showing the uh, publication, uh, publication, another publication that shows uh, the stability and the active compound and through the use of some biomedical uh, uh, techniques in order to establish the most active agro and present. And further, we went further to show the mode of action that also published a paper and document this showing the uh, term and the biochemical activity that join together with some bioinformatic results, which I will still explain further. We went further to see the molecular uh, metabolomic aspects and carried out the structural elucidation using the uh, APR, CFTR, and NMR, and uh, cause the 45, 95, 105 cause it to show a, an established relationship between the genomics, bioinformatics, metabolomics, and the proteomics of the Bahabisada agent. Not only that do we stop at the research level, we went further to document our patents in this regard, and we have done that. Now, during COVID, we do a lot of works that have to do with artificial intelligence, edge, and a lot of uh, internet of thing based smart agriculture, because uh, we discover that bioinformatics have come to be a sustainable tool that we could use. So what do we do? We research into the use of Agrobots, that could become a kind of robot, most especially in unaccessible area that we have challenges of some infrastructure, especially in Nigeria. So some of my students are um, recently working on that. We went for that, I was talking about climate change earlier. So we went for that to see how climatic conditioning could be monitored and automated system could come to place. Not only is that we went to start on a social community and protection of social services, then we went for that to show and establish internet of things in monitoring aquatic environments and a lot of other stuff. And one further to see how we could design a kind of intelligence system that will enhance a such water stream production using a goosey logic. Not only that, during 2021, when there was COVID, uh, my research team uh, that is being headed by Dr. Wadazami from India, we went further to show evolution of profile structure, analysis of various cassava mosaic because uh, cassava form a kind of staple food that is being conserved and used by many people in a lot of industry. And uh, it starts as a source of carbohydrates, but the yield loss ranges around 1.9 to 2.9 billion per annum in the eastern and the central world of Africa. Now, Proficult virus were researching to because they have a kind of multifunctionality around the virus and all stages of various cycle. So what do we do? 
there is plenty of information on whether the ICM uh, coronavirus virus isolates have a kind of relationship that relates around the profane cults and could we get a kind of new pesticide that could be used to manage. So what do we do? I employ uh, our research group use a lot of bioinformatics uh, techniques to achieve this. And uh, this has been established. And this is showing a lot of uh, cofinical family around it and showing the following three around the profane code in front of the neighbor joining method using mega as software. We went for that to show the graphical alignments of the COVID-19. And we went for that to show the distribution of the consumed muscle region uh, in the Kazama mosaic vira. Not only that, we were able to establish the three-dimensional monology mode of the Kazama mosaic virus. And we were able to compare the biology to process ontology, the cellular process uh, components ontology and molecular function ontology and the graphical representation of the active gene. So during this, we discover that uh, the profane cults could be used and serve as a kind of new bioprocessor that could be used in regulation of uh, management of cassava mosaic virus. So this is showing the gene reports uh, where we publish the article. Also, uh, our group headed by Dr. Razani uh, also projects of our activity on activity. And we did a lot of uh, robust profiling of the surgical P450 in agriculture, medical and industrial notable as in order to understand uh, more insight into the personal origin, family, expression of both people for uh, function. Now, what do we have though? Uh, this work will also receive a very big award by to a sponsor and giving to uh, the leader of the government, Dr. Rosalie, uh, uh, he got a grant by American Society of Microbiology and Federation of European Microbiology Society and many delegates that gave us a travel award to America to present this particular award. So what am I saying in essence, we were able to establish the taxonomic distribution of the rotative in our various aspergillus strains and this showing the evolutionary trends we're able to establish the prediction of the subcellular localized analysis of the protein uh, gene in the several aspergillus. And this is showing some of the uh, secondary metabolism gene uh, cluster for the various aspergillus that we tested. Also, we went further to establish the white genome of uh, such a more athanaria species. And this is showing the evolutionary relationship within the P450 gene in 13 athanaria species. And this shows their subcellular cytochrome profile in various species. And so it's the secondary marble life in the 13 of the house. And uh, this is showing the publication with recently got of a group uh, that's where we have established the role of the metabolic gelos virus. And we went further to establish the evolutional relationship between them. And this is showing the various uh, thing. Also, in autumn area, we have been able to do that. And uh, also, we've been able to establish comparative uh, phylogenetic analysis of the cycle of paper three monolysis from fusarium species. Also, this is under consideration because fusarium and some other uh, sponge species, like uh, Aspergillus parasiticus, because a lot of uh, problem of aflatoxin. So, our group have been able to establish through the help of bioinformatics. Uh, tools to establish uh, some atosigenic strengths that could be used and establish a kind of uh, jointly bound uh, competitive uh, with toxigenic strength. That is, they could be used to eradicate toxigenic strength as well as that is responsible for formation of cancer and globalism. So, my group also work on crystal regular enterprise short patterning spread called CRISPR. And we have used it. And recently, we won a grant from USA, EU, Africa, Asia, Pacific, and Caribbean Normal Initiative. And now to see with the help of Nanotube and uh, genetic engineering and some other thing, how we could easily pass uh, the, um, uh, genetic material into the, and this is showing the graph. And we have done a lot of work in uh, application of bioinformatics uh, to establish active compounds for microorganisms. And this shows some of the results of the blast. We've been able to get and establish. And uh, presently, we now discovered that some vegetable and tell beneficial of our microorganisms like endophytic 
they establish a very safe comparable in lab and they could be used and towards the progression of a drug that could be used for management of several diseases. Now, also, we also use some bioinformatics on natural resources. We see in silico screening of selected medicinal plants, could serve as a both in the of transmitting for phase, uh, menstrual for sarin two implication for COVID, uh, whenever they understand. So in this particular study, over 132 phytochemicals from uh, Zinia of analysis and estimated annual and moringa level was screened as a potential inhibitor of transparency membrane serine. And we were able to establish using silicon method to establish, and this showing the sequence element of the protein sequence, and this showing the proctor recommend plots for the variation of the modern disruptive profile. And we went for that to show the result of the modern traits of policies may use in our program. And we also show the three the cattle types of profile, modern, and uh, a lot of interaction as the residue of uh of finance colour a hanam and this showing for the marine level and this showing the publication uh where we have documented our findings so CRISPR we've used CRISPR also in our group for a lot of things uh for management for with my analysis and we have done a lot of work on our machine learning and machine learning and deep learning the management of our community and also we've Establish a lot of work in the area of function extended reality in healthcare. Um, we should learn a lot of virtual augmented and mixed reality. And we went further to biomedical data and transfer learning, uh, high alternative of a thing in robotic healthcare, and cyber simulation in uh, biomedical application of 3D and able to type customized research on healthcare. And uh, CRISPR has been used by some other group, not my group, and management of sickle cell disease in gene therapy. And uh, in all the gym apathy, and they've used it in management of uh, liver disease and also the sabotage of organs in pegs and the reducing malaria. Uh, they've using reproductive medicine and uh, CRISPR baby also is going on on therapy gene. A lot of work have been done in that and HIV management, cancer management in fixing a lot of hematological disease, all that. Uh, CRISPR has been used for genetic screening and future protection also, and uh, a lot of application for a lot of things. A lot of scientists have done a lot of work and application of bioinformatics in production of uh, vaccine, and a lot of work is still also going in Nigeria. Also, uh, during this, we've used uh, a lot of diagnosis techniques for management of AV, machine learning, for management of COVID, uh, internal of things, of internal of air things, for COVID management. Smart Sentinel, now my research group, some of my PhD students are working in the development of a sensor that could sense, and we use a lot of uh, that for by Mazas in producing all this uh, uh, about sensor, and we use uh, a lot of that techniques for diagnosis also in treatment of uh, COVID 19. Now, on the whole, for me to round up, it has come to a point that we, in kind of multidisciplinary approach, Need to integrate whatever we are doing and encompassing as a universal set, making bioinformatics as the model. Of so that means we have to allow transitionary, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, and modern scenario needs to come together. We need to work together for us to form and solve the majority of the global problem. Now, I will say that we need teamwork. We need to carry the students at secondary school and other. I remember some of the time the CBN government came to my university not to see whatever we do. So we need to carry government along. We need to involve people. So at this point, I would like to invite many of you to join my series at uh, US. I'm a series editor to several test books. So you can join me and you can see some of the projects uh, that they switch by informatics and another about technological advances that we have done. You can join them. And this is my company, you are welcome. And I would like to invite all of you to recent advances in biotechnology. technology one behind the program with it. And this change some of the program we have held in the past. And uh, definitely, as a bioinformatician, why am I showing this? We need awareness. We need to synthesize people. We need to conduct training. This is some of the training where we invite experts in the area of bioinformatics that they visit Nigeria. And we can still collaborate for more of this. Not only that, we need to talk to the government. I was invited by the uh, Senate of the Federal Republic in 2016 and last week to come and talk about science. So 
we need wow. to talk to the government about what we are doing. So in view of this, let me say thank you for all the opportunity. Uh, these are some of the professors that have really helped me and some countries. And also looking forward to collaborate with you and talk oh, for more right. opportunity. Thank, thank you, you so much, Professor. Uh, you've actually touched a lot of these things and you were able to go to 175 uh, slides within that period of time. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we've seen how that professor has touched on different aspects of research, even from the microbiology perspective to integrating genomics and doing quality research. Thank you so much, Professor. It has actually really been a great thank time you, uh, being, being here with you. Uh, it has actually been a very, very great time being here with you. Uh, on this note, I would love to say that uh, that uh, our next presenter, uh, she is on ground and uh, and it's so lovely to really have her here. I'm going to share my screen now so that uh, we will be able to see the next person. Um, can we see my screen? Yes, we can. So can we see my screen? Can you hear me too? Yes, yes, oh, go ahead. Okay, so real quick, I'd just love to, to introduce uh, Dr. Venere Raz. Uh, she just have a simple uh, introduction because of the time. Uh, she is a training and outreach coordinator with hereditary health and uh, what's the third age? You're gonna get to know Bowel Network South Africa. So. Uh, uh, Dr. Vinny Raz, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, please, uh, can we give her the, the uh, co-host right so that she can share our screen? She's already at All, mm -hmm. all yeah. right, uh, please just go into, into the full screen mode such that we can see your screen maximally. Can you just confirm that you are seeing my screen and not the present view? Yeah, 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 yeah. So we can see you now. Great. Okay. Perfect. So hi everyone. So yeah. We can but see your notes. Presenter view. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Let me just see if I can switch. It is kind of in a presenter mode. We can still make use of this. Yeah. Perfect. Now. Sure. Okay. Sure. You can see it now. Yeah. Perfect. So hi everyone. I am Verena Das. Um, I. Package. So I just want to thank everybody for firstly inviting me um, to be with you all today. It's It's been a really wonderful day so far, actually. I've really been enjoying all the presentations, all the talks, and, from, and learning from everybody else's experience as well. So I'm getting a warning that my internet is a little bit unstable. So if you all don't mind, I'm actually going to just switch off my video so that my screen stays up and you can hear my audio. Um, but I'll switch it on a little bit later if my internet stabilizes a little bit. Right, so just to give you an overview of what I will be just touching on briefly with this talk, I would like to give you all a brief overview of HCA Bionet and who we are. Um, I'd like to cover very briefly as well some of the HCA Bionet training um, and also our training models. I will discuss our multiple delivery training model in a li little bit more depth um, than some of the other things I'll talk about because this is a model that we really, really are really proud of. Um, as, as an organization, and a lot of development went into this model, and, and I'll talk to why it's been such an amazing model for us. And then I'll also talk to how we've adapted this model more recently for much more advanced um, bioinformatics training, and then I'll touch on some of the other mechanisms that we are using um, to share our training and make it a little bit more reusable, a little bit more findable. Um, and interoperable. So I'll speak to FAIR and bioschemas a little bit, and then I'll speak to the DSI Africa initiative, but more specifically, um, Ilwazi, which is the open data science platform and the um, group that I'll be forming part of going forward. So for those of you who might not be um, too familiar with us, I just thought I'd do a quick introduction to HA Bionet. So H3A Bionet is a pan-African bioinformatics network, and we are part of the Human Hereditary and Health in Africa Consortium, also known as H3Africa. 
And at the moment, we are currently comprised of 28 partners and we are spread across 17 different countries. And so we have quite a nice representation across Africa already, which I'm, I'm quite happy about and I'm sure everybody's quite proud of. And we have over 200 members at the moment. So we are quite a large consortium at the moment. But HA Bionet was established to develop bioinformatics capacity in Africa, and more specifically, to enable genomics data analysis by HA Africa researchers across the continent. And that was our, our initial goal and aim, and it's expanded a lot more since then. Um, but mainly, basically, HA Bionet is developing human capacity through training and support for data analysis, and also facilitating access to informatics infrastructure by developing or providing access to pipelines and tools for predominantly human microbiome and pathogen genomic data analysis. And so the major goal, of course, of HA Bionet overall is then to increase the number of qualified bioinformatics graduates on the continent, but also to create research opportunities and also, very importantly, provide some financial support for promising new graduates in the area of bioinformatics. Um, one thing HA Bionet really wanted to do was to kind of slow the brain drain in Africa and attract some Africans back to the continent um, who are studying abroad. So to make Africa more attractive as a bioinformatics you know, leader across the world. And so one of the ways that we of course do that is through training and that's um, predominantly what I do as part of HA Bionet. I work with the training work package and we work on um, you know, designing inclusive training models um, and just unique training modalities so that we can reach as many people across Africa as possible. And so HA Bionet does training in a number of different ways. Um, so we have run over the course of the last decade or so, a lot of face-to-face -face workshops. Um, we've done a lot of train the trainer style courses. So we, we focused on developing capacity in trainers. Um, we've also awarded quite a few internships. Um, and so internships have obviously slowed down a little bit during the COVID years now, but um, before that we did try to move graduates around so that they could get hands on or experience um, in different labs. And that's also been something that we try to push quite a lot. We've done a lot of live and online training. Um, and we also focus a lot on hackathons and jamborees and each of these components are done with a different end goal in mind. Um, and I want to say that when HA Bionet just started, um, obviously the focus was a lot on face-to-face -face workshops. And so with that, we ran many face-to-face -face workshops, but we realized very, very quickly, we've got a huge network across Africa. And when we run face-to-face -face workshops, we are reaching 20 to 30 people per course or per workshop. And so that was really just not good enough. And so we wanted to create models that could reach more and more people across Africa simultaneously so that we could actually train more people simultaneously and in that way also increase capacity for a lot of this type of work. And so one thing we really um, worked really hard on is developing this sort of multiple delivery mode training model. And so it uses a lot of different approaches um, to, to teach particular courses. The first course that we ran and one of our flagship courses is our introduction to bioinformatics course. Um, and this course was run because of course there was a need for just foundational training across Africa. When HA Bionet just started up, a lot of people wanted foundational training, but we couldn't run, you know, a hundred face-to-face workshops in a year. And so what we did was we decided, well, let's try this multiple delivery mode training model. And it was designed to reach multiple classrooms, multiple sites across Africa at the same time. And how the model works is that we would basically have institutions apply to host the classroom. So we'd have a call for classrooms. Um, they went through a rigorous selection process. And if we, if we felt that they had the, the capacity to run the workshop, they were accepted as a host. We then allowed uh, a round of participant applications and each classroom basically had this set of participant applications. They did their selections as well. And these participants then joined that classroom. But what made this, this model really, really unique is that although it was a distributed classroom model, within each classroom, we had a coordinator, we had a teaching assistant, and we had a systems admin for on-site support. And then we had all of us um, in the background as the core team also supporting those classrooms with an added level of support. And so what this allowed us to do is to reach hundreds of participants across 
numerous classrooms every year now. We're running IBT actually now for the seventh time this year. And last year we had something like 50 classrooms running at the same time, spread across about 15 or 16 countries in Africa. And we had close to 2000 people taking the course at the same time. And that was really fantastic for us. Um, so the whole course we feel is quite scalable. We started with about 26 classrooms and it grew organically to about 50 classrooms. I don't know if we're gonna have more than that this year because my capacity is wearing a little bit thin to manage everybody. Um, but yeah, for all intents and purposes, as long as you have more hands on the core team, the model can continue to grow on end really. Um, but what we did with this particular model is we made use of a lot of online tools initially because we wanted to remove that um, infrastructural burden on the classrooms because they were spread across Africa. They all had different issues at the time. Sometimes they, they were low resourced in terms of capacity. Some classrooms had intermittent internet. And so we all are aware of a lot of the problems in Africa. It's a very, very heterogeneous sort of environment. And so this kind of made the environment a lot more homogenous because now um, everybody was using the same online tools. And so all you really needed was a computer and a browser and you were good to go. But then we started training thousands of people across Africa. And so now everybody was coming back to us and saying, well, this model is wonderful, but how can we do something more advanced? Or can we do something more advanced? And so at some point, myself and, uh, and another um, training person at HA Bionet went, well, let's try and do something more advanced and let's see how it goes. And that kind of spurred and sort of led to the development of an adapted multiple delivery model. And so what we did with um, a 16S course that we ran for a couple of years now is we actually had a bunch of people from different domains come together. So we had us as the trainers and the curriculum developers. We had developers come together, um, sys admins come together. And we decided, well, let's try and package all the tools, the data sets, software, dependencies, packages, everything into a container. Let's actually now try and get these classrooms to pull that container, install it, manage it, run it locally, and then see how they fare. Um, and so what we did with this particular model is we had a smaller cohort of classrooms because now the infrastructure became very important. HA Bionet has invested a lot in infrastructural development across all of our nodes across Africa. And so we were quite confident that the computational resources were there um, in most cases. And so we also wanted to have them develop their, the, their own ability, both for 16S analysis, but also for running these kinds of courses and workshops on their own, even if HA Bionet disappears for whatever reason. So what we had them do was pull these containers, give all the students access to their servers or clusters, wherever the container was hosted, and they actually needed to run analysis in the cloud for the course. And so this, a, a lot of people kind of told us, um, you're a little bit crazy. We don't really think this is going to work. Um, but I'm, I'm really proud to say that it has worked. and It's been working for a few years now. Um, and we've run, I think, about three or four iterations of the 16S course now. And at the last course, we had about 30 classrooms who all ran this course in this sort of model. And it worked really, really well. One thing we also do with the model is we actively manage everybody with the learning management site. And so we actually track every single participant all the time. And so we give them graded tests and assignments. Um, there's lots of feedback tools, forums, and we manage literally every single participant quite actively. And we also grade everything that they do. And so this was a very exciting model for us to see work. Um, it also then caught the interest of the international community really. And Last year, for the first time, we teamed up with the Wellcome Trust, and they've got a wonderful um, NGS course that they run. But their course is run, obviously, with, with a slightly different model, so they use a VM. And so we tried this model last year for the first time um, for that NGS course. The VM was incredibly large. It was about 40 gigs unpacked. When it was zipped, it was 20 gigs. And so each participant had to pull this VM and then you know, work with us via the learning management site and online lessons um, because of COVID. They couldn't join the physical classrooms anymore. So the whole course became virtual, um, but it still worked. It became a truly blended learning experience, but it was really exciting for us to see that whereas the Welcome Trust could reach 20 people per workshop and they ran the workshop maybe twice a year, 
last year alone, I think we reached, I think over 300 people with, with that um, training and it ran for about three months. This year, we have about 600 people on the course and 59 classrooms doing NGS analyses and really advanced analyses. Um, so they're doing everything from QC to RNA seq, chip seq, genome assembly, really the whole shebang. They, they're going, they're working their way through the content and they're managing. And so that's also been really exciting for us. And so I won't speak to, to a lot of these, these topics um, in too much detail, um, just in the interest of time, but I did want to just touch on a couple of other things that HA Bionet has been doing um, to just increase and grow the impact across Africa as well. And so one thing we are focusing on quite heavily, not just in training, but overall is the concept of FAIR. So making everything findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And so we are making sure that we are really hitting all of those FAIR indicators, whether it be with our software and tools or with our training materials. And um, one of the ways that we are making things more fair is also by implementing bioschemas. And so we are currently testing the implementation of bioschemas. Um, so bioschemas allow you to mark up your website with some semantic text. And so it allows obviously scrapers, web scrapers, especially to find um, your content quite easily, at least in the case of training materials. And so there are three different schemas that relate to training. And so we're trying to implement them and what this will help other web scrapers and people who host catalogs of training, for example, to do is to automatically pull in any training we've ever done um, once these schemas are implemented. And again, in that way, we are making our training materials very much more findable and accessible. Um, and it's also being duplicated in, in a lot of other repos, which, which I think is very exciting. We also have embarked and assisted with a lot of competency development for bioinformatics. Um, so the International Society for Computational Biology has suggested a core set of competencies that they would like bioinformaticians to have. Um, and so what we do is we actually use those competencies to drive all of our curriculum development, even workshops and courses are mapped to competencies because it's very vital to us that we actually develop these competencies at an appropriate level for the, for the audience or the user, the end user. So what the, the ISCB competencies have done in the past um, is that they've come up with a whole bunch of personas. I've just taken a snapshot of a couple of the personas. There are very many more than these. Um, and then the, what they've done is taken their competencies, the, their suggested core competencies, and they've used Bloom's taxonomy to map out, you know, at what level does all of these different personas need a particular competency. And so what that does is really just help drive the development of your course and make sure that you're hitting the, the competency at the correct level for that particular persona. And so I've just got a couple up here on the screen. You can see I've got a physician, a lab technician, an ethicist, and a biocurator, for example. And then I've just pulled out um, just a snapshot of some of the competencies. These are not all of the competencies. There are more than these, um, but these are just the first few. So you can see here that um, basically we map, we use Bloom's taxonomy to map the level or the depth of knowledge that they would need or ability or competency for these competencies. Um, so just for example, statistical research methods, um, we would basically suge suggest that all of them basically have knowledge to comprehension level in terms of Bloom's taxonomy, but a biocurator might not have to, um, yeah, so a biocurator would have to have this competency at this level, whereas the others could have it at a lower level, but we use it in that way to just kind of develop curricula, and it's been very interesting the way that our curriculums have actually changed as a result, um, and so these competencies are actually being further developed now. There's a paper coming out, I think, in maybe about a month's time, maybe less, um, where we basically are expanding these competencies to include more data science competencies, but also adding um, knowledge, skills, and attitudes. And so um, we hope that that will also assist everybody in using the competencies. And there are, there's a lot of other developments happening around these competencies. Um, so lots of tools that the ICB, for example, are working on, automated tools where you can go to the website, for example, and say, um, I am a physician and I want to learn X, and they will pop out what competencies you actually need to develop to be considered um, 
you know, competent at a particular level. So that's been quite interesting for us. One other thing that, that HA Binary is focusing on quite a lot are guides and SOPs. Um, so if you visit our website, possibly after this talk, um, you will see that we have a lot of SOPs, a lot of how-to guides um, that we've been developing that's based on a lot of our work. I'm not going to talk to obviously all the others, but I'll talk to the training guide. Um, we've developed quite a comprehensive training guide as well. So if you do not have experience in running bioinformatics courses, we've put together just a very short guide. It's not very comprehensive, but a quick guide um, to guide you through the main steps that we typically take when we design our training. And these steps are on the slide. So you can see that we think quite thoroughly about the way that we do training. These are our steps just for workshops. Um, courses sometimes can, can be a little bit more complex. And of course, degree programs a lot more complex than this. But um, this is our, our basic training workflow. And so we follow this for each and every course that we design. And what we've done is we've packaged that into a little, um, just a simple PDF document that also has a whole bunch of templates and little um, help guides that can help you do training in the way that we do it, if you're interested in, in that, of course. But we've made lots of resources available. Everything's um, been created under Creative Commons licenses. And so you're welcome to take it, adapt it, reuse it as you see fit. And so that's also something that we're really excited about. And all of these resources are loaded onto public repositories. Excuse me. <clears throat> the one that we use quite a lot is um, Ziva Hub. So Ziva Hub is the UCT instance um, of Fixture. So it's a local instance of Fixture. And so we use this quite a lot um, to upload our materials um, and to make it more findable. It attaches a DOI, it versions the materials. And so it's really quite lovely in that way. And we actually upload all of our training materials now um, onto Ziva Hub. And so if you went to Ziva Hub now and you search for HA Pioneer, you'd actually see all of our older course materials that we've managed to curate so far available there as archives that contain um, workflows, slides, often videos, data sets. So just whatever you would need to actually be able to do that training, hopefully on your own. So that's been quite great. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to speak to the DSI Africa initiative in too much depth, but I just thought I would tell you a little bit about the, the um, DSI Africa initiative. It's quite sad for me to say that HA Bionet is actually soon coming to an end. We are ending our funding cycle. Um, we've been funded for, I think, more than 10 years now, so um, it's time for something new, I guess. And so we've been funded by this new NIH DSI Africa initiative, and basically, um, the whole idea behind this initiative is that infrastructure and capacity development are a big focus, of course, of boosting health research on the continent. And so um, the work will be facilitated through five-year grants that have been awarded by the NIH, by the, the Common Fund, which is called Harnessing Data Science for Health Discovery and Innovation in Africa. And they've awarded actually in the region of $75 million dollars um, to various research hubs that are that are in various places and are focusing on different things. Um, so some research hubs are obviously data intensive, um, so focusing on the science, but then there are also training groups that are focusing on increasing just capacity for, for analyses. And um, there are also things like LC research groups, so groups exploring the ethical, legal, and social implications. And then there's the Open Data Science Platform and Coordination Center, which is um, the group that I'll form a part of going forward. And really, this group just wants to facilitate the development of a trans-African network of data scientists. So just to tell you just briefly about the ODSP, the ODSP will, in essence, develop a flexible, scalable open data science platform for the DSI Africa Consortium to find and access data, select tools and workflows, run analyses, uh, but very importantly, on a choice of computing environments, all through easy to use workspaces. And then administration and support of the core resources and consortium will be con con kind of coordinated by a coordinating center. And so um, those of us at the central HA Bionet team, we, a lot of us will be forming part of that coordinating center going forward. 
But together okay, with- Please, can you just round up quickly so that uh, we could have the next uh, panel? I think we just have okay. 10 more minutes for the African session. Please continue. <laughs> sure, I thought I had 30 minutes, but no problem. Um, All right. Okay, sure. So let me just actually wrap up then. So this is just a quick snapshot of what that platform is going to look like. We'll have all these workspaces where you can basically choose um, how you want to run, what you want to run, um, and it's going to be federated. So you can either bring the data to the tools or the tools to the data. And so we're very excited about this whole initiative um, and where it might lead African science. And I'll stop there. <laughs>